place your hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., do solemnly swear. I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter the duties of the office on which I am about to enter so help me God so help me God congratulations thank you, thank you very the vice president of the United States of America is the second highest public office in the federal government many of the men who have held this office have risen to the office of the president. Others continue to serve their country through representation in Congress or philanthropic public works. And still others have faded into obscurity. The methods for selecting the vice president, and indeed the office itself, have undergone many changes in the United States' 200 years of existence, which is easy to understand in a position which, like the president, was created in a time before the prevalence of political parties. While the position is sometimes ignored or maligned, even by those who have held the office, the vice president is an important figure in American politics and government. The vice president's duties to his country, his constituents, and his president are varied and many. Join us as we take a look at the vice president from politics to power. The second office of this government is honorable and easy. The first is but a splendid misery. If, like Thomas Jefferson said, the vice presidency was easy, he differed in opinion with the United States' first vice president, John Adams. Adams famously said of the office, My country has, in its wisdom, contrived for me the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. And as I can do neither good nor evil, I must be borne away by others and meet the common fate. Largely ignored by President George Washington, who rarely consulted Adams on policy or other matters, Adams took his other constitutional duty as President of the Senate very seriously. The main crux of the Vice President's responsibilities in the Senate is to cast tie-breaking votes in the event that legislation deadlocks. Adams, during his two terms as Vice President, cast a record 29 tie-breaking votes, a number that has still never been beaten. Only later, Vice President John C. Calhoun would come close, with 28 tie-breaking votes. As President of the Senate, Adams also actively persuaded senators to vote against legislation he opposed. And more than once, Adams gave stern lectures to the governing body about procedural and policy matters. Adams was forced to restrain himself, however, by the start of his second term as vice president. Adams' zeal had attracted the attentions of critics of Washington's administration, making him a target. Washington's opponents threatened resolutions that would reduce the vice president's powers even further, silencing the office, except in matters of procedure and policy. Afterwards, Adams remained much quieter than he had been in Senate affairs, which surely must have aggravated the brilliant but vain statesman. Adams would regain his political power and more when elected president in his own right in 1796. Still, the experience clearly left Adams bitter about the process of democracy as he wrote in his unpublished 
Letters to John Taylor in 1814. Remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. It is in vain to say that democracy is less vain, less proud, less selfish, less ambitious, or less avaricious than aristocracy or monarchy. It is not true, in fact, and nowhere appears in history. Those passions are the same in all men, under all forms of simple government, and when unchecked, produce the same effects of fraud, violence, and cruelty. Though Washington and Adams were the first president and vice president to not see eye to eye, they certainly would not be the last. Under the initial terms of the Constitution, the Electoral College was responsible only for voting for president, rather than both the president and vice president as running mates. Article 2, Section 1 of the United States Constitution made clear the process by which the president was to be chosen. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. And they shall make a list of all the persons voted for and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all of the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if there be more than one who have such majority, and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for President. And if no person have a majority, then from the five highest on the list, the said House shall in like manner choose the President. But in choosing the President, the votes shall be taken by states, the representatives from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two-thirds of the states, and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. In every case, after the choice of the president, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the vice president. But if there should remain two or more who have equal votes, the Senate shall choose from them by ballot the vice president. This plan, however, failed to foresee the formation of political parties and even personal and political differences of opinion between the two candidates, such as the case between Washington and Adams. When Adams was elected president, the president-elect had been a staunch Federalist, while his runner-up, and now vice president, Thomas Jefferson had aligned himself with the Democratic Republicans. As it happened, the two men were often at odds about foreign policy and other issues, such as states' rights. In the election of 1800, the two parties actually ran candidates for vice president but the electoral process at that time had no way of differentiating which candidate they wanted for president and which for vice president. As it turned out, the candidates Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr wound up with a tie. It took the House of Representatives 36 ballots to elect the winner, with Thomas Jefferson emerging as president and Burr as his vice president. Four years later, this incident was rectified with the 12th Amendment, which instructed electors to use separate ballots for president and vice president. Some argue that this diminished the prestige of the office, contending that the vice president was no longer a challenging presidential candidate. Under the amendment, if no vice presidential candidate received a majority, then the matter fell to the Senate. In theory, this could have led to a situation where the incumbent vice president in his role as president of the Senate, would be required to cast his tie-breaking vote, either re-electing himself or his successor. While this particular situation has never arisen, the Senate has voted for the vice president exactly once, when Martin Van Buren's running mate, Richard Mentor Johnson, was accused of having lived with a black woman. The 23 electors from the state of Virginia refused to vote for him although they still voted for Van Buren. The Senate then elected Johnson in a 33 to 17 vote. 
Once the election is over, the vice president's usefulness is over. He's like the second stage of a rocket. He's damn important going into orbit, but he's always thrown off to burn up in the atmosphere. While the 12th Amendment is technically still law, stating the vice president and president are to be elected separately, currently, this is no longer the practice. Presidents and vice presidents are actually elected as running mates, and a presidential candidate's selection of vice president can become just as important as any of their platforms. Inauguration Day, March 4, 1841, saw Vice President John Tyler serve as president of the Senate for all of two hours, when he swore in the new senators, then received and confirmed President Harrison's cabinet appointments. Some historians posit that John Tyler would have been as obscure as any 19th century vice president if William Henry Harrison had lived to serve out his term. As it turned out, however, exactly a month after Harrison was sworn in as president and Tyler as vice president, Harrison succumbed to failing health and died on April 4, 1841. Two days later, at 4 a.m. the morning of April 6, Tyler returned to Washington and took the oath of office and was sworn in as the 10th president of the United States. Some in Congress, particularly Tyler's opposition, questioned whether Tyler was to assume the office of president full on or if he was to merely be acting president. Those who argued for the acting president label thought the original text of the Constitution did not make clear whether the actual title of president fell upon the vice president or if merely the duties and responsibilities fell upon him as well. Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution only stated, In case of the removal of the President from office, or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the Vice President. For Tyler, there was never any doubt. He was now President, unequivocally. He ignored his critics, who came to refer to Tyler as his accidency and he returned mail and correspondence unopened, which had been sent to the White House that was addressed to the vice president or acting president. Harrison's cabinet, which Tyler had decided to retain, expected the new president to continue exactly as Harrison had. When they informed Tyler of his predecessor's practice of using majority vote to establish policy, Tyler replied, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I am very glad to have in my cabinet such able statesmen as you have proved yourselves to be, and I shall be pleased to avail myself of your counsel and advice. But I can never consent to being dictated to as to what I shall or shall not do. I, as president, shall be responsible for my administration. I hope to have your hearty cooperation in carrying out its measures. So long as you see fit to do this, I shall be glad to have you with me. When you think otherwise, your resignations will be accepted. Tyler's take charge attitude was hard to ignore. His decisive actions led to resolutions passed by Congress officially naming Tyler the 10th President of the United States. The incident set a precedent that wasn't clarified in the Constitution until the 25th Amendment, adopted nearly 120 years later on February 23, 1967. If the tide of defamation and abuse shall turn, and my administration come to be praised, future vice presidents who may succeed to the presidency may feel some slight encouragement to pursue an independent course. Tenth Vice President John Calhoun achieved distinction, but not as a vice president. Though he is famous for a number of firsts in that office, he later achieved more notoriety and influence as a United States Senator. He was the first Vice President to resign, and before that became only the second and one of only two Vice Presidents to serve under two different Presidents. If it be conceded, as it must be by everyone who is the least conversant with our institutions, that the sovereign powers delegated are divided between the general and the state governments. 
that the latter should hold their portion by the same tenure as the former. It would seem impossible to deny to the states the right of deciding on the infractions of their powers and the proper remedy to be applied for their correction. The right of judging in such cases is an essential attribute of sovereignty, of which the states cannot be divested without losing their sovereignty itself and being reduced to a subordinate corporate condition. In fact, to divide power and to give to one of the parties the exclusive right of judging of the portion allotted to each is, in reality, not to divide at all and to reserve such exclusive right to the general government, it matters not by what department to be exercised, is to convert it, in fact, into a great consolidated government with unlimited powers and to divest the states, in reality, of all their rights. It is impossible to understand the force of terms and to deny so plain a conclusion. Initially supportive of certain tariffs as a way of generating governmental revenue, Vice President John C. Calhoun, who had served in that office under John Quincy Adams and by 1832 was serving under Andrew Jackson, led a debate over states' ability to declare federal law unconstitutional. The nullification crisis of 1832 arose when South Carolina issued an ordinance that essentially nullified federal tariffs. Calhoun's home state in his view, had every right to pass this ordinance. The issue caused a rift between Calhoun and President Andrew Jackson, as well as others in Congress. Those who supported the nullification said that the tariffs only stood to benefit northern manufacturers and not southern farmers, who had already been hit hard by an economic downturn. In December of 1832, Calhoun resigned from the office of vice president deciding that more political power was to be wielded in the Senate. And indeed, he soon held more influence in that position. The very essence of a free government consists in considering offices as public trusts, bestowed of the good of the country, and not for the benefit of an individual or a party. The government of the absolute majority instead of the government of the people is but the government of the strongest interests. And when not efficiently checked, it is the most tyrannical and oppressive that can be devised. The nullification crisis was one of several key events that many historians argue led the United States into the Civil War. Calhoun was an anti-abolitionist who supported slavery as an integral part of agricultural industry in the South. Calhoun inspired many Southern secessionists with his strong rhetorical defense of the institution of slavery, running counter to abolitionist sentiments coming from the North. I consider the Tariff Act as the occasion rather than the real cause of the present unhappy state of things. The truth can no longer be disguised that the peculiar domestic institution of the Southern states and the consequent direction which that and her soil have given to her industry has placed them in regard to taxation and appropriations in opposite relation to the majority of the Union, against the danger of which, if there be no protective power in the reserve rights of the states, they must, in the end, be forced to rebel or submit to have their paramount interests sacrificed, the domestic institutions subordinated by colonization and other schemes, and to themselves and children reduced to wretchedness. Though Calhoun died over 10 years before the start of the Civil War, the cast iron man directly influenced the secessionists of 1860 and 1861, and his ideological rigidity and determination to defend the causes he believed in led him to be named in 1957 by a Senate committee as one of the five greatest U.S. Senators, along with Robert La Follette, Robert Taft, and the other two members of what historians have named the great triumvirate of congressional leaders, Henry Clay, who represented Western expansion, and Daniel Webster, representing the ideals of the North. The ideals of the Southern slaveholder, the settlers of the frontier, and the Northern business owners were all at odds on the issue of slavery and its abolition or expansion. And now, Mr. President, 
instead of speaking of the possibility or utility of secession, instead of dwelling in these caverns of darkness, instead of groping with those ideas so full of all that is horrid and horrible, let us come out into the light of day. Let us enjoy the fresh airs of liberty and union. Let us cherish those hopes which belong to us. Let us devote ourselves to those great objects that are fit for our consideration and our action. Let us raise our conceptions to the magnitude and the importance of the duties that devolve upon us. Let our comprehension be as broad as the country for which we act, our aspirations as high as its certain destiny. Let us not be pygmies in a case that calls for men. Never did there devolve on any generation of men higher trusts than now devolve upon us for the preservation of this Constitution and the harmony and peace of all who are destined to live under it. Let us make our generation one of the strongest and the brightest links in that golden chain which is destined, I fondly believe, to grapple the people of all the states to this Constitution for ages to come. A member of the aforementioned Great Triumvirate, Daniel Webster, was a beloved statesman and senator from Massachusetts in the period leading up to the American Civil War. Remembered as an eloquent speaker and one of the nation's most prominent conservatives, Webster served in the House of Representatives for 10 years, the Senate for 19 years, and was named Secretary of State under three different presidents, Millard Fillmore, William Henry Harrison, and John Tyler. Many viewed Webster as a mouthpiece for the interests of bankers and industrialists, failing to represent any concerns of the common people, particularly those in the Democratic Party under Andrew Jackson. He fought staunchly against secession and the Civil War, once stating, When my eyes shall be turned to behold for the last time the sun in heaven, may I not see him shining on the broken and dishonored fragments of a once glorious union, on states dissevered, discordant, belligerent, on a land rent with civil feuds or drenched, it may be, in fraternal blood. Let their last feeble and lingering glance rather behold the gorgeous ensign of the Republic, not a stripe erased or polluted, nor a single star obscure, bearing for its motto no such miserable interrogatory as what is all this worth, nor those other words of delusion and folly, liberty first and union afterwards. But everywhere, spread all over in characters of living light, blazing on all its ample folds as they float over the sea and over the land and in every wind under the whole heavens, that other sentiment dear to every true American heart liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. Webster unsuccessfully ran for president three times, failing to gain the nomination in 1836 and 1848, and coming in a distant third in the election of 1852. In both 1839 and 1848, the Whig Party offered Webster the vice presidency, which he declined stating, I do not propose to be buried until I am really dead and in my coffin. Ironically, both of the presidents offering the office died while serving as president. The death of William Henry Harrison and later Zachary Taylor would have seen Webster ascend to the office of the president. It could be argued that the low opinion he held for the office of vice president destroyed his own shot at the presidency itself. Whatever his goals as president would have been, Webster continued in politics with a career that spanned over 40 years. In 1957, Webster, too, was named one of the five greatest U.S. senators of all time by a Senate committee. Men may die, but the fabric of our free institutions remains unshaken. For a total of 16 times throughout United States history, the office of the Vice President has been vacant. This has been mostly through death, 
But two vice presidents have resigned, such as John C. Calhoun. Calhoun felt confined and marginalized in the office and left to pursue a far more influential career as a senator. I could not think in the present state of parties of entering again in the political arena. I would but waste my strength and exhaust my time without adding to my character or rendering service to the country or advancing the cause for which I have so long contended. I feel no disgust, nor do I feel disposed to complain of anyone. On the contrary, I am content and willing to end my public life now. In looking back, I see nothing to regret and little to correct. My interest in the prosperity of our country and the success of our peculiar and sublime political system, when well understood, remain without abatement and will do so till my last breath. And I shall ever stand prepared to serve the country whenever I shall see reasonable prospect of doing so. George Clinton and Elbridge Gerry, fourth and fifth vice presidents, as well as Henry Wilson, Thomas Hendricks, Garrett Hobart, James Sherman, and William R. King have all died in office. William R. King, who served as vice president under Franklin Pierce, also has the distinction of serving the shortest term as vice president, with only 45 days in office before succumbing to tuberculosis on April 18, 1853. While his career in that office was short, King remains the only vice president to hail from Alabama and held the highest political office of anyone from that state so far. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.